We've already come to the end of January 2024. Liturgically, we've come through the birth of Jesus, through, through Advent and Christmas at the end of the year. We've come through Epiphany, which celebrates the visit of the Magi to baby Jesus shortly after birth. And as you can see on the front of your bulletins, this is the fourth Sunday after Epiphany in the Christian liturgical calendar. And in order to celebrate the full life cycle of Jesus in a calendar year, or shall I say the full human life cycle of Jesus by Easter, the liturgical calendar condenses his life so that as Christians we can revisit it year after year to deepen our understanding and increase our faith and add new followers and deepen our discipleship. So it's January 28th and liturgically we've already headed towards the crucifixion, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Ash Wednesday which commences the Lenten season is February 14th. Good Friday, the day that marks Jesus' crucifixion is March 29th. Hopefully you're getting the picture that we've got a short amount of time. The lectionary text will take us through the movement of the three years of Jesus' ministry in about two more months. Easter is March 31st. So the celebration of the birth of Jesus, which we did in December, and the lectionary scriptures will take us through the life through March 31st. And every year, the new year allows us to hit the restart button, if you will, reflecting and learning about the life and ministry of Jesus, allowing us to grow in understanding and in faith and in discipleship. One of my favorite scriptures is Proverbs 4 and 7. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. There are people who are Christians their entire lives, and they never really come to an understanding of who Jesus is. So in this time that we have, don't miss the opportunity between now and Easter to increase and improve your understanding of Jesus, his mission, his ministry. For your knowledge and your understanding to be refreshed and renewed, don't, don't miss this opportunity. It will give you a new resolve to follow Jesus at all costs. Today's scripture gives us the opportunity to revisit the foundations of our faith by reflecting on one of the first messages and moves in the ministry of Jesus, by what is recorded in what we believe to be the first gospel recording in writing, and that is the gospel of Mark. Notice that it is in the first chapter of the gospel of Mark, for the earlier you are in a gospel, I teach in Bible study, the earlier you are in Jesus' ministry. So this is the first chapter of Mark. It's the beginning of the ministry. Mark doesn't really have a, a birth narrative. It's one of those gospels that doesn't go through the birth. It starts in Jesus' adult ministry. Jesus was born. We hear of him in other Gospels in the synagogue at 12 years old, listening and teaching, missing for three days with his parents looking for him, to which he says, why are you looking for me? Did you not know it was necessary for me to be in my father's house? After that, Jesus grows apparently in obscurity. Of the remaining teenage and young adult years, Luke 2.52 says, Jesus matured in wisdom and in years and in favor with God and with the people. The next we hear in the Gospels, including in today's Gospel of Mark, is John the Baptist preparing the way, baptizing Jesus, Jesus entering the wilderness to be tempted, and then according to the Gospel of Mark, Jesus calls his first disciples, Simon and Andrew and James and John, they're all fishermen, and he says to them, follow me. And they left everything they had, and they followed him. And the first stop, according to Mark, was Capernaum. 
So in our scripture today, Mark 1, 21 reads, they went to Capernaum. And when, they, when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. Jesus and his first few disciples enter a synagogue and Jesus begins teaching and the people immediately notice that they are experiencing something they've never experienced before. So much that it conjures the question a little bit further down in the text, but I'm going to pull it on up for a minute. What is this? That's the question I'm seeking to answer today for those on this journey called Christianity, and you're not sure what this is, but also for those who think they know what it is and may need to hit the restart button to discover something new about your tradition and your convictions. I hope to help somebody today who has the question or may not know they have the question, what is this? Let's all be willing to hear the answers to the question, what is this today? And first, in order to answer the question, what is this? Let's answer the question, who is this? Jesus is Jewish and he's a teacher. They may see him as rabbi, as he's often called by the people. He's teaching in a synagogue. But clearly, Jesus is more than a Jewish rabbi. At the very beginning of the first chapter of the earliest recorded gospel, this gospel of Mark, the very first verse says the beginning of the good news about Jesus Christ, God's son, happened just as it was written about in the prophecy of Isaiah. That's the first verse of the first chapter. You don't have it in your bulletins? Bible, check it out when you get home. The very first verse of the first gospel recorded, which became part of the canon, is loaded with answers to the question, who is this? It tells us that Jesus is the Christ, which means the Messiah. Some versions say he's God's son or added God's son and that he's the one prophesied to come in the Old Testament prophecy. For earlier in Isaiah 9, 6 of the Messiah, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So in answer to the question, who is this? So we can get to the answer to the question, what is this? Is the gospel of Mark's claim right out the gate that Jesus is the Messiah, the one they've been waiting for, the son of the living God? Jesus goes on to be baptized in Mark 1, 9, and the text says that he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice from heaven said, you are my son whom I love with you. I am well pleased. Even during the encounter in the synagogue, the man with the evil spirit, who we'll get to later in verse 27, calls Jesus the Holy One of God. So we've answered the question, who is this? This is Jesus, not just any rabbi, this is the Christ. Jesus, the anointed one, Jesus, the Messiah, spoken of by prophets as wonderful counselor, mighty God, prince of peace. It's important that we understand who this is because it sets the stage for what this is. Jesus had a divine assignment. This, the Messiah had an assignment to usher in and demonstrate God's kingdom. The government would be on his shoulders and the people of all cre and all of creation would be set free and would see it together. So Jesus, the Christ, the one they've been waiting for is right in the synagogue. Now we know who this is because we've got the privilege of the scriptures in front of us, the, the gospel. But they don't know who this is. So let's meet them in the synagogue in Mark 1.21. It says, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded. If you have a pencil, underline astounded. They were astounded at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So the first answer to what is this 
It can be found as this text. So now that we know who this is, the first answer to what this is, is this is a different kind of teaching. It's a, it's a different kind of message. And what was the message? What is this? Well, whatever it was, they were astounded by it. Sometimes we just gloss past words, but that's meaningful that they were astounded. Mark doesn't give us the content of what Jesus said, but, but we know the messenger. We know Jesus, so we can use our Holy Ghost imagination that the message went something like this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to, to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release of captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to set the f set free those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And Luke, it says that he said today this scripture, which comes from Isaiah, has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's Luke 4, 18, 21. And if you happen to go to Luke, you'll find that it's right before the very verse that, that mirrors the verse in Mark of him being in the synagogue in Capernaum. Check it out later. It's, it's a synoptic gospel. Some of the gospels you can lay by side by side and you can see the stories that are in the multiple gospels. This story is in both Luke and Mark and maybe others. They were astounded by his message. Astounded because it was bold. Astounded because it was powerful. Astounded because it moved their hearts. Astounded because the poor really did need good news. Astounded because there were many captives, some wrongly accused, and they needed to be set free. Astounded because the message, whatever it was, was liberating because we know Jesus and it was inspiring and moved them like they'd never been moved before. The Bible says they were astounded by the message for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were the teachers of the law who translated the law to the people so they knew according to Jewish law all the do's and the don'ts. No doubt that was oppressive sometimes. No doubt that appealed to their heads and not their hearts. So they were astounded because Jesus was appealing not only to their heads, but also to their hearts and their spirits and their humanity. Because we know Jesus. Whatever the scribes taught, they knew this wasn't that. So they asked, what is this? He's not like the scribes. Well, they give us a clue about one of the differences. They say he taught them as one having authority. Whatever Jesus is teaching from the Old Testament scrolls, he was speaking with authority like he had the authority to make it happen. For if by chance Jesus was teaching from the Isaiah scroll, they'd heard it before. But now, because we know who it is, we know they are hearing from the one who can make it happen. The one who has the authority to bring good news to the poor, the authority to give sight to the blind, the authority to set the captives free. They had heard the prophecy before. But it was without conviction and without power. But the Jesus that we know, the Christ, the son of the living God, they are hearing for the first time and they are astounded. For the first time, the prophecy has legs and feet and a mouth. Who said, excuse me, of himself that today this is fulfilled in your hearing. We're about to do some things with this Isaiah text or whatever text he was reading. I am sure he gave the sense and the spirit that we're going to do some things. I'm going to do some things with this text that we read over and over and over again. Together, we're going to make it happen. Wouldn't that astound you? you you've you been hearing this over and over, and now there's someone before you that actually sounds like they believe it, and they're going to make it happen. Have you ever been tired of talking about something over and over, and you're ready to make some things happen? then you can imagine what the people experienced in Jesus and why they were astounded by his words and his authority. So what is this? Not only is this an astounding message, it's a message full of authority with the promise to make it happen. And that means it's a message that's followed by ministry. 
I'm still in the text, verse 23. It reads, just then there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? Didn't have time to really deal with that part. I know who you are, the Holy One of God, he says. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of the man. You may wonder where I see ministry. The Bible says that the man had an unclean spirit. The common English version of the Bible says he had an evil spirit, trying to break it down a bit. And that evil spirit inhabited a human who was not born evil. His spirit was evil. So Jesus ministered to the man by commanding the evil spirit to come out of the man. He spoke to the, the spirit. It's part of the ministry of preaching for those who preach the gospel of Jesus. Jesus freed the man of an evil spirit with authority to do what the Isaiah prophecy says. He set the captive free right before their very eyes. Jesus came not to just talk the talk, but to walk the walk. And they could tell something was different from when the scribes spoke to them. Right there in front of them, he ministered to the man and he set him free. And that's what ministry is. Ministry puts legs and feet on the word of God. Ministry takes authority to do what is needed to fulfill God's plan for the world. Ministry takes authority to not only feed the hungry, but to figure out why in the richest country in the world there are hungry people. Ministry takes authority to not only seek the release of captives, but to find out why so many of those in the carceral system are black and brown men. Nearly 70% of the federal system. According to Prison Policy Initiative, the, the U.S. population of, of black Americans is 13%, but the population in prison is 37%. Faithful Christian ministry seeks the injustice in that and, and doesn't rest until some tables are flipped and some matters are addressed, putting legs and feet to setting the captives free. So Jesus, with authority, calls out evil and sets the man free. Now that that was just one man in one moment and one form of ministry. And when the people saw this again, they said, what is this? Then somebody put words to it. A new teaching right in your text with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. So what is this? It's a mission. And it's as they said, a new teaching. It's a teaching with the mission of changing lives, a teaching that leads to ministry, a teaching that recognizes and calls out evil. It's a new teaching that confronts evil at every hand. That was a new teaching, not the scribes, the legal experts with no authority, but a new teaching with the power to back it up, a new teaching that set captives free, a new teaching that was not only astounding, but also followed by action. Jesus was just getting started. So, so what is this? It's a mission. And if you didn't know, now you know that Jesus was a man on a mission. He had an assignment to usher in God's kingdom by teaching and demonstrating its power, its principles, and its prophetic nature. And he knew he had a short time to do it. So Jesus was just getting started. And what he really was starting was a movement. Somebody say movement. Listen to verse 28. It says, at once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. So what is this? It's an astounding message. It's different from the scribes because it moves minds, hearts, and spirits. It's a message that gives hope to the hopeless. One day Simon Peter said to Jesus in John 6, 6, 8, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. The message was astounding because it gave hope to the hopeless, but it also gave help 
to the helpless. For Jesus spoke with authority, with the power to take action, not to just talk the talk, but to walk the walk, which makes it a ministry with a mission. And in order to accomplish the mission, Jesus knew he had to start a movement. So what is this? It's a movement to usher in God's reign of love and peace and justice on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus didn't set out to be famous. He actually set out to be followed. And in order to start a movement, you need those who will follow, who will also speak with authority, who will also use the power of the Holy Spirit to take action, who will do what they need to do to set the captives free. What is this? It's a movement. That's why Jesus said to those he picked up along the way, follow me. And as Christians, we too are followers. So hear Jesus saying to you, Follow me. Follow me and be astounding. You are a child of the Most High God and God reigns forever and ever. So follow me with authority. Follow me into ministry. Don't just talk the talk, walk the walk. Follow me with your mission, which should reflect a continuation of the movement. Follow me and be part of this astounding, authoritative, powerful movement until justice rolls down like water and righteousness like an ever mighty stream. Follow me. Follow me until love is the principal thing and guides your hearts, your minds, and your actions. See, we have the benefit of the gospel. So we soon learn that Jesus also teaches the law. He doesn't stay away from it. He teaches it. And he teaches that the greatest commandment is love. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. On this hangs all the law and the prophets. So I'll close with this. The ultimate and the final answer to the question what is this? It's a four-letter word. What is this? This is love. God bless you.